We'll begin with our third panel discussion. Uh, the topic is Global Perspectives for Business and Resolving Cross-Border Commercial Disputes. Please welcome our session moderator, Mr. Somesh Tiwari, Managing Partner at Vardharma Chambers. Please give him a big hand. Our second panelist is Mr. Piyush Gupta, Senior Corporate Counsel at Singapore Airlines Limited. After this, we'll be heading for lunch. Uh, I know the energy is low, but please. <laughs> Yes. Our next uh, speaker is Ms. Anju Jain Kumar, former VP, Public Policy, APAC at Netflix, and Chief Regional Counsel, APAC at Disney. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Mr. Dixon Saw, Director, Head of Intellectual Property, <laughs> Intangible Assets, Practice at CHP Law. Lastly, but not the least, Mr. Bhupendra Singh, Managing Partner at Artham Law Chambers. Hi, everybody. Um, so, I got volunteered to be the vo me, um, moderator. From what last check outside, no one has any violent objection at the moment. Let's see how it goes tonight. Okay, so my name is Dixon. I run the IP and IA department in CHP. This morning was a very hectic one, I was, and I'm very happy to announce that as of this morning itself, CHP got voted in as a best, one of the best law firms uh, in Singapore. So you can read, read, <laughs> thank you. So you can read through the uh, straight time today to see where we are and things like that. If you have time, say hi, and I'll introduce you to some of my colleagues who are here with me. So I'll let the panelists actually introduce themselves, maybe starting from you, Bupinta. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bupendra Singh, managing partner of Artham Law Chambers. Uh, we practice primarily into the commercial disputes and the tax dispute practice. We are based out of Mumbai. And I'm looking forward to an interesting session on the mediation bed. And I'm sure that you guys will definitely have you know, some insights, both from the Singapore side as well as India side. Thank you. Yeah, interested in, in terms of how this course will go, since we disagree with each other so much. <laughs> <laughs> and you, please. Hi, I'm Anju. Uh, I'm a media and entertainment lawyer. Uh, previously been with Netflix and Disney. Hi, um, I am Piyush. I um, am a competition lawyer by training, but I have been in the aviation industry for about uh, 20 odd years now, um, looking at everything that an in-house counsel does, so cross-border disputes, along with all the corporate advisory work as well. Um, hello everyone, my name is Somesh. I'm the managing partner of Vardharma Chambers. Uh, we do cross-border transaction advisory and ADR uh, in India and across MENA and Southeast Asia region. And uh, over to Dixon to take it over. Thank you. I, th I, think, I think we had some conversation outside and uh, last week on, on a few things and you'd be surprised how much you can condense it today because we only have a very short time. But I think part of the things I observe that, because we serve different clients, both internally and externally, so perhaps I can ask, going through the panel, how does it affect your selection or your advice to the client in terms of dispute resolution mode? whether it's domestic or international. Let me undo the stuff first. Sure. So I, I think one of the things I've observed, and I speak for the industry that I've been a part of for over 20 years, uh, which is media and entertainment, that I think how we have handled domestic disputes is very different from how we look at cross-border disputes. So domestic disputes, your choices can be tactical and strategic. Uh, that means you could file, uh, you know, contentious uh, proceedings before uh, quasi-judicial or judicial bodies, um, you know, not bearing in mind long-term costs, et cetera, because you're uh, more interested in immediate relief, et cetera. Alternatively, but when we look at cross-border disputes, it's a very different dynamic. I think there it has to be very strategic because of both the time and resource investment. And in my experience, um, I would say, you know, literally it's one or two percent of contentious matters actually find their way uh, before a court of law uh, or even before arbitration. Uh, most often uh, we've seen uh, 
uh, us advising as well as, and I think, a complete buy-in within the organization to be able to resolve it with business strategy uh, and or uh, informal uh, mediation or discussions uh, to resolve it and not go before courts. Right. I think this is the startup private kind of thing. Let's go to the other one. You know, I was on government, right? Until recently. <laughs> <laughs> So Bina is a big uh, element in terms of the balance of power within the ecosystem in that sense. So maybe you can share your views in, in this. Uh, sure, thanks. Yeah. So I would tend to agree with Anju in terms of you know how the entire uh, arbitration and the mediation, whether it's domestic or cross-border, is being looked at. Now, as a practitioner, what we tend to do, and lately so, is that you know we try to bring both the parties on a mediation table. The whole objective is that if you look at the arbitration as such, right, the time, the cost, and at the end of the day, the challenge which can always happen against an arbitral award. So we kind of you know, do a cost-benefit analysis, and we tend to suggest them that, okay, to the extent possible, let's keep our egos aside. Let's look at the business, right? And then if you can come to a common table where it's a win-win situation for everyone, then why not? So that's where we are trying to kind of you know, push more of the mediation. And lately, at least in the domestic uh, commercial disputes, what we have observed mm. is that parties are at least willing to discuss. Mm. It's not just the case that, okay, take all or leave all. It's like, okay, let's come to the common path and see how it can kind of you know, move forward from there. While this is on the commercial side, on the tech side, maybe during the course of that discussion, <laughs> I'll share my views. But yeah, over to you, Nick. Sure. I, I think it would be good to look at the two prior, the other private practitioner in the panel. Sumesh, you, your, your views? Um, so I, I have a, a similar view, but a, a little, you know, I have a little partiality towards what I, what I, what the way I look at businesses and how I advise them. Uh, we do a CBA, um, and I think that's that's basically standard for everyone. You do a cost benefit analysis. You understand how how much time and resources a company is putting in. What is the end effect of how will you resolve this dispute, and how much you are going to get out of it towards the end of it, and that's that's going to be a very key role, right? Um, but uh, just if you give me 10 seconds, I'll share something very personal. Uh, one of the first major arbitrations that I did in my life uh, was led by a very, very senior counsel uh, in Delhi. Um, and he, after the, I mean, during the arbitration, there's a break. So I asked him a couple of questions. So what's your strategy? How are you going to go ahead from this? What are you taking this? And he said, um, so Mesh, I'll tell you something that uh, in, in terms of an arbitration, or even for that matter of fact, a negotiation, uh, do not enter the room if you think that you will get exactly what you want. Do not do that, because that's, that's not how it works. So once you advise businesses, you have to keep that in mind. See, of course, the interests of the clients are, of course, you have to take, to take care of that as well. But in terms of advising a client, I think that that is some, something that we should also consider that once you are advising something, you have to also tell them that this is something that this is practical, this is achievable, this is your CBA and as to how to break down the cost analysis and also what you're trying to get towards the end of it. And if at all, where are you willing to settle? If you are understanding your, your, your line of where you're drawing as to where would you like to, you know, what's your second best, apart from I want everything, like what, you know, Sir mentioned, uh, I don't think that you that 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 works. Uh, ultimately, when you advise client, you have to be honest, you have to be upfront, and you have to do. And I do a. I'm a little prejudiced because I think of I think of money before everything else. So I would think of how would you see commercially a dispute comes up, how much you are investing, how much time will it take, how much time will you will it will it you know in terms of executions and everything. So that's that's what I how would I would you know I generally go about things. Thank you for sharing the personal view with us. So I'm going next to Piyush, who's uh, well, acting for our national <laughs> ally carrier. What, what was your view? Um, thanks. Um, actually, I tend to agree with uh, most of the panelists um, because at the end of the day, our, we are working with the organization as an in-house counsel. We're working with the organization to counsel them. And that is precisely the sort of role that we have to play, not just in terms of um, counseling them as to the repercussions of the dispute or the potential dispute, but on all the aspects. So it has to be, like Somish said, 
has to be about the cost involved. It has to be about uh, what benefits um, are we getting it. Um, it also involves whether if this matter potentially goes out in the public, would there be any negative publicity around uh, the entire thing? Would there be? Would it be a long drawn process considering different jurisdictions and the different forums involved in those jurisdictions? So it's all of this um, which in turn decides, uh, which in turn we need to figure out when we decide to um, advise the board or the, or the senior management in terms of whether this dispute should be contended and if so, where and how. That is, that is I think, very, very important for, for us as in-house counsel and for the private practitioners as well to advise the clients on the entirety of what they're thinking. And um, one final thing is, um, upfront, I check with my business units on what is it, what is their uh, floor in respect of the dispute? Are they willing to, if it's a commercial dispute, are they willing to walk away from the deal? Mm -hmm. If not, then the entire um, sort of, uh, the, the entire perspective changes. And then you figure out how you want to get this uh, implemented. So there, there are quite a number of things which have to be taken into consideration. Yeah, I agree. You need to have the end in mind. And uh, well, when I was in law school, right, the first day uh, we were doing procedure, I remember my, like, my prof told me every dispute is actually a commercial decision. And I think, I think it can be quite in agreement with the panel here, looking at what you're looking at and what end point you're, you're going for, it will actually affect which route to take and what strategy you take. Some litigation strategy could be a finance strategy to narrowing issues in terms of getting uh, when you're dealing with a group of different uh, defendants, for example. Now, in terms of a respective field that we practice in, um, what are some of the trends you see? Maybe, uh, so much if you don't mind, you can start the ball rolling. In terms of the re in the, what you do, what are the trends in terms of uh, dispute resolution that you see uh, over the past few years, particularly? Uh, particularly, I think that uh, the latest that, that I could think of is after the COVID era, uh, the trends of, of doing ODR has come up brilliantly uh, across borders uh, because it's, it's some, some for companies, for example, huge companies, it's, it's become easier. Uh, you don't have to travel that much. It's, it's you know, convenient. The, most of the paperwork is done online. Uh, everything's set up beautifully before even the arguments start. Uh, you, you know what, what the setup is going to be all about. And I think technology over the years, even after the COVID era has done fantastically well, personally, that what, that's what I felt. And I, I see this taking off, I mean, brilliantly in the future. Uh, because uh, I see that during 2012 to 2014 initially, there was a huge boom in the arbitration realm and everybody just, just was trying to get in on the arbitration bandwagon. Everybody was just like, let's do arbitrations a lot. And I think this in the next couple of years is going to take up massively. Why? Because ODR is a way that in uh, very thought that arbitration is going to be cheap. Uh, later on, we realize it's not. It's really not. It's, it's it, for a company, especially huge transaction, commercial transactions, of course, sir knows better than you know, most of us that it's going to be huge transactions, huge paperwork, and then you, know, you have to fly down teams, get together, strategize, and you know, the manpower involved, the money involved, it's crazy, right? So ODR, I see that the, the, the financial out, out, you know, aspect of an ADR mechanism wherein it was going overboard, it is now coming down, and th that is the trend because of ODR. So online, online dispute resolution is something uh, which, is, which is worked out massively. In fact, I was, uh, you know, so there, there's an Indian uh, think tank called the Niti Ayog. Niti Ayog is now, you know, uh, giving, uh, coming up with something, some, some public policies in, in, in reference to ODR as well. I think uh, US and Europe is also now getting in on, on all of this. And we know all, you know, we, we know that if, some, if the West starts doing it, then everybody starts following up like that. You know, it's, it's a sheep kind of a trend for some reason. I don't know why, but that is the trend. And uh, you, uh, so in terms of numbers, 86% uh, of personal injury cases in the US solved by ADR, 66% mm. of cases, remarkable success, 66% of cases resolved within the first 30 days of, of clicking in. So if I look at numbers and I see how this is going to be something that I look at as a, as a client for a you know, matter of perspective, 
And I look at it as a client, I'm saying, look, I am investing 30 days, 60 days, and there's a 60% chance of, of, of a resolution, you know. So I, I would rather, you know, invest my time and energy into it rather than going into a court, then getting an execution done, and then there's a, then a whole mechanism, different, different mechanism across the board. So the, personally, I feel that technology coupled with ODR, that is the latest, latest sort of trend that I've seen uh, emerging, uh, in, specifically in cross-borders. Upindo, what do you think? Uh, yeah, so I think I would tend to agree with Somesh on most of the things. What we are also observing is that, you know, there's a change in mindset. Now, most of the companies, whether it's a, as small a matter as a commercial recovery or commercial disputes, or it's as big as, you know, a multi-million dollar deal, parties are more inclined to get into the discussions and negotiations, right? And that's where I personally believe that, you know, there has to be a will. The element of will is what makes the difference. If you look at the Indian legislative system, we have all types of legislation, whether it's a Commercial Courts Act, which definitely mandates some sort of mediation, right? Then we have got Mediation Bill of 2021, of course, pending approval with the parliament. <laughs> so uh, the point here is that, you know, more than the bill, I think there has to be a will. As long as both the parties have that will to resolve a dispute, I don't see any challenge. And I generally advise to my <laughs> clients is that, you know, whenever you think that, okay, there could be some ego element coming in for X, Y, Z reasons, just step out of the conversation, mm -hmm. right? Let your other business heads, whether it's advocates or some other business heads, let them figure out at a solution. And this is what ADR as an alternative dispute resolution is picking up, especially in the domestic market. And we are also seeing a few instances where even in the international uh, disputes, we are trying to get into more like a mediation kind of approach because it's binding on both the parties. Both the parties go out of the door happily. Interesting. Fiyush, what's your view? I think for me, it's a pretty short answer because um, unlike what Bupinder said, I'm um, working for a company which uh, still has archaic, uh, sort of uh, an archaic take on how disputes are to be resolved. Um, and there's no change of ideology or thought process. Um, in our case, the default is um, court, right? And um, irrespective of whether it's domestic or international. Fortunately for us, SIA being a brand in itself, uh, most cases we tend to sort of get our way, uh, where we say, okay, courts in Singapore courts, and that's pretty much it. Uh, but having said that, there are obviously instances where uh, for someone like a Boeing or, or an Airbus, it has to be um, by arbitration, um, again, based out of London or, or whatever, which is which used to be the case, what, 10, 15 years ago. But it still is the default position for a company like SIA at this point of time. Having said that, uh, in the last couple of years, we have seen a slight uptake on the interest towards SICC, the mm -hmm. commercial... Yeah, International Commercial Court. And and that also is, while I say slight uptake, it's, it's uptake in interest, not it, it hasn't pettered down to the contractual uh, obligations of the parties at this point of time. But at least people have now started looking at this as a potential alternative. Uh, but mediation, no, I mean, mediation is just like, okay, we get our room, senior management in a, in a room and they can hash it out amongst themselves then. That's pretty much it. Yeah, thanks for the tip. <laughs> I'm, a medium, I'm a mediator myself. <laughs> now, just turn to the person who actually was the closest area to what I do all the time. <laughs> so, Andrew, what, 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 what are the views given that you have gone through some of this public policy in, in, a, in a very IP heavy yeah. and business heavy kind of driven uh, enterprise? So, so, what's your view in terms of trend? So I think in terms of trends, I'm seeing a, a shift from traditional media to say streaming or digital media. And I think when we look at cross-border uh, disputes or contentious matters, uh, the setting of global precedence is, or national precedence is becoming a really important matter. So for example, something that's being litigated in Korea could have a bear bearing on how governments view policy in another country. And so therefore, while at a purely contractual commercial arrangements, you would look at settling matters, and that's been the sort of, uh, uh, you know, been the practice and the experience. I think what you're seeing is some issues which could potentially set a global precedent 
even if not entirely, because the globe is not just one globe, but it's just so many fractions, right? But if you could see, say, something becoming a trend in a certain part of Asia or in Europe, then uh, you would fight it. Uh, and if it has a long-term impact on whether cost or business strategy, then you would see uh, and you would view litigation very differently. You could potentially challenge that law. You could potentially challenge government in, in those areas. Or you could have uh, private uh, um, uh, disputes as well. Uh, to challenge that position. Mm -hmm. So I do see a slight shift in trend in the connected world as opposed to traditional media where not necessarily you know, laws of one country had a bearing on public policy in another, whereas I think that shift is taking place now. Yeah, I observe the same thing. If you look at my request from my clients itself, you will see in contractual drafting itself, like collaboration agreement, you are actually kind of layer out the dispute structure so what you can see is that, let's say for collaboration agreement between two labs, for example, there will be a, a kind of a operational dispute resolution kind of structure framework inside. So the parties who are operational on the ground can kind of settle it first and, see, and can see how it escalates. And when it hits to the point where nobody party can agree, that's where the dispute resolution clauses get activated. And that calls for the different conversation we have now. And I see that a lot of startups are uh, using this method because essentially they may not have the muscle to actually go through that. Now, we spoke a lot about now and how things are, trends are moving forward here and there. I wanted to hear one thing from you guys. It's like if there's one thing that you can change, uh, what would it be? Let's start with the most gorgeous person we have in the panel, Piyush. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, let's start with Andrew first. No, absolutely not. So Mesh was eyeing for that. I, I, I can't say I wasn't. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This one got to be me. Yeah. Okay. So um, actually, one thing that that could be changed is um, potentially the parties, uh, the the intent of the parties to take up mediation, mm. because to me that is one particular area of dispute resolution which has a lot of traction, which has a lot of advantages, but at the same time, especially in the Singapore context, um, and, and especially in cross-border disputes, uh, that area is very rarely tapped on. It's almost always arbitration or uh, now with SICC, but mediation with the inherent advantages that it brings onto the table, uh, both, in term, both in terms of cost efficiencies, in terms of um, the efficient uh, resolution or uh, proposed resolution. That is something which has not been adequately tapped upon um, in international disputes. So that is one thing that I personally feel uh, could be, uh, we could do more of. Definitely, in terms of mediation itself, right, for some of you who are here, uh, who were here yesterday, uh, you have heard from my ex-colleague, Ms. Trinaha, Chief Legal Counsel of IPOS, IP Office Singapore, that introduced certain uh, kind of grants and policy Look, after the Singapore Treaty has been signed, you will see that Singapore is moving to lot, facilitating the growth in this area, both from talent, facilities, and also into a procedure. So uh, there are a lot of support there. I mean, we are, I think understanding is IPOS is also working with other uh, rele I mean, relevant agencies like WIPO to actually move this ahead. So if you guys want to know more, we can have a chat later. But uh, in, in the meantime, let's go for wish list, Anju. So mediation was uh, definitely one of uh, the things, but I'll add to that wish list is, uh, it'll be interesting to see how mediation evolves. Singapore would be a great template for that potentially, uh, particularly in IP industries. But I think if you just look at pure judiciary, uh, I, I do see across APAC, that's where my experience is, that I think uh, a deeper understanding of certain industries would really help because it would really cut down on the time spent in educating uh, judges or, or arbitrators on how they handle these disputes. Uh, very often, uh, we have to spend just an inordinate amount of time trying to make them understand nuances of our uh, industry. And I think, say, so if I, if I see a little more uh, sort of, if uh, that's a wish list, which is really probably certain industries, maybe, uh, benches that have a deeper understanding uh, of, of the industries would really be helpful. Yeah. So, Pupinda, you've been silently sitting in this corner watching the show. <laughs> that's, the, that's the best part. You uh, know? That's <laughs> Sit at job. job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sit at the back, back bench and see everyone. 
All right. So I think as far as my wish list goes, I would tend to agree with Anju. Just to add on to that is that, you know, the time frame which is taken. Okay. So the fact is that whether it's mediation, which is so to say as of now, you know, it's unregulated or unapproved from the legislative perspective. But as far as arbitration goes, there should be a definitive time frame. Exactly, you know, what should be the time frame and how the arbitral award will be executed. It's more important into a cross-border transaction. Because that's where we have seen challenges at times that, okay, once you get a favorable award, then execution of the award is another battle to fight for, right? Uh, so my wish list would be that, you know, there should be some more, you know, streamlined procedures and process and something like just an example like OECD. It decides for the entire world yeah. how the transfer pricing or the tax regulation should be, mm -hmm. right? Something similar, a common body, I'm not saying OECD or something else, but a common body which can at least give it definitive time frame and specifically on the execution of the awards. I think it comes to a lot about government policy and also cultural. It right, does, yes. Now, so, Mesh, you and I had the longest and most passionate exchange out there. So, we don't want to hear, that's why I put you right at the last. Maybe you share with us. No, no. Same I, thing out there. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy <laughs> to go in the last. Uh, in fact, uh, when, when you asked the question, I knew, I knew immediately what my wish list would be. And uh, when, when ma'am uh, Anju ma'am started, uh, I thought she, she's saying exactly what I wanted, but I'd add on to that, ma'am. Uh, so in terms of appointment of an arbitrator, my wish list, I'll say, for example, if there is a dispute, I'm just going to build on what you just said, because that's, I'm battling something, uh, you know, in, in court like now. In terms of wish list, I would want that when the courts are appointing arbitrators or even parties are appointing arbitrators, they have to be industry centric or you have someone on the panel as an expert of that industry, whether it's construction, whether it's energy, whether it's aviation, there has to be someone who understands how this industry works, maybe media. For example, please understand this. There are times when you start an arbitration and then you want us, I mean, if you've started just an arbitration right now, you want immediate relief of some sort, some sort of an interim, right? But unfortunate, as it may sound, the, 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 the judges or someone who's been appointed as an arbitrator, he wouldn't appreciate the nitty gritties of, of what you're saying. You, so for example, if you're from the energy field or, or again, aviation or something like that, you're saying I'm losing how, these many, you know, million dollars a day because of, because of this compliance not being done and this is now becoming subjudice. I'm losing all, all, of, all that money that person is looking at just the dollar bills and not how it's impacting that industry and that client or that person or that party as a whole when you are losing money you're losing you're losing everything right at the time your 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 contracts that are that have to be executed later on your relationship with that party because if you're working with them continuously all of that that has to be a very industry centric approach if you don't have that and, and it's, it's very unfortunate because sometimes why, what happens uh, in cross-border transactions, I, I feel that even there's a, if there is an arbitrator or mediator appointed and he has some knowledge about how, how you know, in general things work, okay, for about any exam, any, any field for that matter of fact, he has some idea, all right, media does this or maybe aviation does this or maybe energy and construction does this, broader perspective. If you don't know how that business runs or if you don't know how that particular lateral runs, adjudication becomes absolutely abysmal at that point of time, according to me. I, 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 my first wish list would be that I either have an expert on, on the, on the uh, you know, arbitrator panel or, or not an expert in terms of appointed by parties. And I'm not, not, not talking about something like, you know, experts crunching the numbers together and something like that. No, someone on the bench who understands the industry-centric approach, who understands how both parties are losing, uh, what they're losing, what is at stake, and how they have to move forward. So uh, just building on uh, what ma'am said, uh, in court, yes. Uh, executions, what, what sir said, yes. Uh, but I would, I would nip it in the bud. I, you have to start from the bottom, you have to start from the appointment. So the appointment is sorted, more or less every, everything else is sorted. That's what I feel. Sorry, just to add on um, here, um, what, what Somish mentioned is true, but uh, he, he sort of had a caveat towards the end to say that this is applicable only where the parties are not appointing the arbitrator, where the arbitrator is appointed by 
the arbitral uh, the, the the rules of arbitration now that is where it sort of brings me back to my very first statement which i said that as an in-house counsel you're supposed to counsel the the company and if you're in an industry where you feel that there aren't enough um, experts in that particular industry uh, to be to act as an arbitrator that is where uh, so i'm i'm actually um, mingling so Mesh's point and Anju's point here. That is where um, SICC as a forum makes a huge uh, amount of difference because that is a, a mandatory forum where experts are uh, flown in either uh, from Correct. within Singapore or internationally. And, mm -hmm. and that is where, that is the USP of that particular forum. Mm -hmm. um, so you have industry experts looking at your particular industry and then adjudicating upon the, the, the disputes. So within the aviation industry, at least for, from our side, that is why there is now an uptick in interest because we feel that in uh, contrast to arbitration, where we may end up in a position where um, someone is appointed uh, who is not an industry expert, uh, we tend to try and, and float the idea of, okay, let's let's look at I, SICC as an alternative as well. Yeah. I think that's an important part. Um, what I see in the gap in the market is actually, there, there is a platform to talk about this. We can't, we can't, well, we can't, I mean, unlike Americans, uh, we, 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 most of us are not involved in the judicial selection part in terms of the, at the national level. But definitely, I mean, there are some tools out there, I think things like, I think they're called ResoX, R-E-S-O-X itself, where they, they kind of cluster this uh, mediators, arbitrators and litigators into different uh, expertise. I mean, they can probably slice it off, I mean, even thinner as we go. But I think that's one point to start, uh, understanding that where the gaps are. I think the, if, the, if the technology trend is moving towards what the panelists have said, I think, I think we are, we're actually on a good run itself. She's there, so I think we're almost almost almost, almost done uh, with uh, with our part. Um, do we have time for five minutes of Q and A? Yeah. So I know we are standing between you and lunch. You're holding hostage to that. So so so. Um, so if there's now for the now panel, the ball is in your court. If you ask more questions, then you you're keeping yourself from lunch. ah yes. <laughs> So th thank you, panel. I have one just question to the entire panel. So Ms. talked about that industry-specific mediator or arbitrator should be appointed. I just really wonder the integrity part and the impartiality part because till date, uh, we are seeing not only in India but across the border, people are seeing the judges and the retired judges from a different prospect and point of view comparing to the industry experts. So how you will cross that hurdle of impartiality and integrity of the other people than the judicial member or the retired officials? All right. uh, should I take this first and then we can go? Um, so just one, uh, I need a small clarification. Are you talking about cross-border uh, arbitrations or domestic? Both, both, and because the retired is also appointed in respect Correct. of the cross-border. All right, so this is how I'd look at it. And I've been fortunate because uh, what I have felt, sir, is that uh, when, when there's an expert which has been appointed by the arbitrators itself, so he's, he's, he's an industry expert. It, he, he doesn't have to be known to the parties. For example, um, a certain number of arbitrators, what they have started doing is, which is a trend. So I, this is a two-part answer, all right? Because this is a personal, what I've gone through. So maybe this will answer right. your question. Uh, number one, the arbitrators who are appointing these experts, they, they say, all right, we will be appointing an expert on, on this specific issue to, uh, to see, for example, it's a financial issue, or right. maybe it's a calculation of tax issue, or it's, it's basically a very, very technical sort of an issue. IT is, in right. fact, you know. So they appoint, they, they appoint someone who's, who's not known to the parties, and they, they, that person has nothing to do with the parties. They just get, they give the data to that person and he submits the report directly to the arbitrators for them to actually adjudicate on. So uh, in terms of impartiality, I think a little bit that goes away. Okay. 
secondly, in terms of domestics, sir, uh, domestics, I feel uh, the trend of appointment of an expert of a specific field, uh, specifically in India, I, do, I think it's, it's, it's a slow burning fire. Yes. People have started doing it, especially judges who, who do international arbitrations have started doing it. Um, and thirdly, uh, 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 I think uh, Dixon, uh, uh, and to answer, this is something that I learned very recently uh, in an international arbitration. There's a term called hot tubbing. Mm. And it's not what you think really. <laughs> it's, it's, it's completely different from what you think. Uh, so basically what happens is that both parties appoint experts, all right, outside, not lawyers. Lawyers are not supposed to talk at that point in time. Both parties appoint experts. Both experts sit in front of the arbitrator and both of them have to now basically ask each other questions like a rapid fire round, you know? And they have to ask each other questions and see how they have come and decided and deduced the way they have. Right. So at that point in time, impartiality goes out of the window because you are asking questions directly, right? So for example, if I have to, for example, there's a dispute of valuation. So there are, Come multiple methods. There's a market value method. There's a DCF method. That's there's not you know there's there's you know value method. All of them. So some some company has has made a valuation of something using this method, and some company is using this method. So they get experts from their fields, and they then they sit before the arbitral tribunal with the lawyers. But lawyers are not supposed to talk. So this is a rapid fire. So impartiality at that sense is gone. But again. Uh, my caveat would be this is a slow burning fire. Uh, India, I, I personally, I haven't seen this taking off as much, uh, but I, I don't think that will take up because things get heated, you know, in, in so, so, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <Right. laughs> we've seen that. Uh, we've seen how mediations go. So the arbitrations are something that we are a little more sacrosanct at this moment, but we don't want to spoil that, do we? Right. So, so that's what, that's what I feel, you know, that that's the, that's the way it is right now. And I think in the future also, I think uh, your, your experts have to now come forward and, and justify as to how you've come to this. Their role. Yeah. yeah. And in front of everyone. And, and there's a cross question. So for example, your expert could cross question him in a way that he, he, you know, he, he comes out and says, look, this is not done this way. Right? So the, the truth is out. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. Anybody else? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my question to the panel is uh, how this process of arbitration can be implemented in tax matters where you know the other party is the department? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my question <laughs> is, this is, this is, this is going to be a, <laughs> this is a nerve, I think. Yeah, now we sit on the corner and let Bupesh sit on the corner. <laughs> Yes, yeah. very much. I think in an interesting question, so I'll give you, you know, try to give you a holistic perspective about it. Number one, if you look at the, you know, global transfer pricing, right, at least in India, we have got this AP arrangement. It's a typical mediation, right? You provide details of your transaction with your related parties, and then the government officers or the department guys, they are going to ask you some specific questions. Thereafter, and for the people who don't know about this, there's an agreement which gets signed between the government and the taxpayer. The whole objective of this agreement is very simple. It is valid for next three years, or if there is any change in underlying facts or circumstances, right? Now, I think it is this AP arrangement is more pushed from the OECD side. That is why it has picked up really well in the last couple of years, um, since 2017 specifically. But when we talk about other tax laws, <laughs> right? Say in India, GST, stroke VAT or service tax, it, the story is totally other way around. We as taxpayers want something, the government wants something else. Because the end goal is totally different, very rarely we have seen any kind of you know, mediation coming into place. And that is where uh, the tax disputes are on a rise. Because neither of the party wants to take that chance. For the taxpayer, it's a direct hit on the profit and loss. Because you know it's an indirect tax. When the taxpayer would have supplied goods or services, if the taxpayer wanted to recover, he should have. Now he hasn't recovered it from its customer, but government wants the money, right? So no one will take that chance. 
Uh, in my experience and I think uh, limited experience and the understanding, I doubt there will be any mediation <laughs> as far as the <laughs> GST matters are concerned. Uh, it could be another wish list, uh, at least as far as I am concerned, but yeah, I don't see any kind of, you know, things going away or changing at least on the GST side. On transfer pricing, definitely as customs, you have got SVB, special valuation branch, same thing, literally same as the transfer pricing thing, but GST, absolutely not. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to share one, uh, you know, incident where I appear in the matter. Why I put this question also will justify that. So there are few matters where you, you must be aware in the GST era what has happened. Left, right, center, the adjudicating authorities and the audit departments are, uh, you know, uh, issuing show cause notices. You know, because now it becomes digitalized and people are getting one pager show cause notice. You know, without any allegation, without any, uh, you know, finding, nothing. They are just with one pager show cause notice, they are slapping the taxpayer. Now, uh, taxpayer is left with only one option. He, he either replied to, the, sorry, two options. Either he replied to that show cause notice, but what to reply, right? Secondly, he will uh, go and invoke the red jurisdiction. So once he goes inside the court, the court will ask, you have an alternative remedy, why don't you go and exhaust it? Okay, now there are precedents which says these are the four uh, areas where you can uh, invoke the red jurisdiction. There the department, who is representing the department, they will say, yeah, it's a one-pager judgment or a, a notice. Uh, let, let me take the instruction. Why at that point in time, they are taking the instructions? Rather, this, this, this particular scenario can be, uh, you know, uh, curtailed or removed at the first stage itself, wherein if the taxpayer has the opportunity to tell the, uh, you know, adjudicating authorities, ki, see, you have just passed a one-pager uh, notice, kindly withdraw it, issue a notice with the, you know, anyhow, the writ jurisdiction, they will say, go and uh, remand back the matter right. for the de novo proceedings. Again, the whole proceedings will go on. So it will be time consuming, that's all. The taxpayer is suffering only because exactly. after remand back also, he has to go through the whole procedure. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with you. And you know, I would say people who are from non-tax background, if you think information technology is innovative, try tax. <laughs> <laughs> <Come on. Okay. laughs> so before the technology or any kind of you know solution comes out, there will be tax authority who's willing to tax that. Either income tax, GST, VAT, it does not matter. So there is another example, faceless assessment under income tax uh, proceedings, yes. sir. <laughs> we were discussing. Yeah. Yes, it's like literally it's, faceless. It's the direct violation of PNG, principle yes, of natural sir. justice. Yeah. And I'm, I'm surprised that how that can be happened even in a, in a case like income tax matters where there are a lot of facts. And yeah, at the uh, fact-finding authority level, you are uh, introducing a uh, system called faceless assessment. It's a, I, say, I, I see, really I don't, I'm amazed to see that. So my take is that, you know, government is in a cash 22 situation. <laughs> Only for one reason, they really don't, they want appropriate checks and balances. At starting from the assessment till you go to the appellate level. Uh, now, why it is cash 22 on the other side, when we look at the tax officers, as you mentioned, the example you gave, one page of show cause notice, right? The officers are not utilizing that technology to the best of its abilities. They are simply that, okay, tomorrow is the due date. If I don't issue the letter, it will be barred by limitation. So in that kind of a hurry, they move ahead. They say that, okay, I have met the timeline. Let the court remand the matter back. I will get more time to deal with it. Okay. No, but uh, so, sorry to intervene. And take instructions. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> <laughs> sorry to intervene, but there was an era where they used to issue a show cause notice was 50, 50, 100, 100 pages. Gone are, gone are the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> now we have PDF. Yeah, I was, I was, when I was uh, asked to moderate, I wasn't expecting to revisit the rule of natural justice. I think it's a timely <laughs> reminder of us who have been, not been law school for many years. <laughs> My <laughs> associate Lennon probably know me better than I do at the moment. <laughs> but thank, thank, thank you for that. I, I think we, we have one last question before we close it up, since we are on this flow. Is there any, one more question we, we, can, we can expect? Thank you. Sir. Yeah, thank you for this. Thank you, thank you. Feel free to talk to him after that, you know. This yeah. is not the end. Oh, yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> it's the end for me. <laughs> any more questions? 
So just, you know, one good incident which I was sharing with the panel earlier is, you know, the best part of being a tax lawyer representing taxpayers is that it's a personal kind of, you know, incident. So I was coming back into India and at the immigration counter in Mumbai, the officer asked me the relevant questions, you know, what was the purpose of visit, so on and so forth. Towards the end, she asked me, okay, what do you do? I said, okay, I'm a lawyer in Bombay High Court. And her next question was, uh, whom, no, exactly whom do you represent? I said, companies. Against whom? I said, government. And immediately the immigration stamping was there. <laughs> okay, so as long as you're on the other side, I think it's all good. But at the end of the day, coming back to your first point, I doubt that you know mediation or any kind of ADR can be implemented in tax regime globally, I, I would say, not just India. And I think I just want to add, and that's across beyond tax as well, my experience has been that individual government officers are going to be very hesitant to take calls uh, uh, to s settle a, a matter, even if they feel or they know that that could potentially be uh, sorted out. They would rather do it under the umbrella of a proper judicial body, uh, even if they have to go then go back to ground zero, to your point. Yeah, true that. Can I just add on to what, what Sir said? And I think uh, your question. Uh, so a large part of what uh, my practice areas is white collar crimes, right? Uh, so what is this is what I think uh, Bhupendra Sir will also see that in, 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 in money laundering matters, we have a standard one page show cause notice. All right, M laundered amount, alleged laundered amount up to maybe about 10,000 crores or maybe you know hundreds of millions. One page show cause notice. Now what happened was, and I think uh, uh, the tax uh, regime at some point should consider this, I think because everybody agrees across the board here, everywhere, that mediations uh, or maybe any ADR mechanism is not working in tax matters. Uh, we've, we've understood that. However, there was one very, uh, some very you know proactive gentleman who came up with the idea of filing a writ uh, not like the one you said, their alternative remedy. He challenged this only on the part that, look, there has to be reasons to believe. And you have to give those reasons to believe that there is a violation at every step of the way. So the, the Delhi High Court later now pending in the Supreme Court, the J. Sekar matter. So that was pending. And uh, so they said that you have to give reasons to believe. I think the tax regime, you know, subject to what, what Bhupendra sir will add, that at some point in time, I think if that, that starts happening, that they have to give a reasons to believe it's basically one page translates into two pages. It's not like a 50 again, 100 good old days side of system. But I think if you start giving reasons to believe in tax matters, I think these are your violations. These are your sections under this financial year. This was filed and the balance sheet shows this and this was this. Please justify. You know, it makes it easier for the taxpayer to go back. So I think if you have a reasons to believe sort of a judgment that comes in tax, uh, unlike, uh, you know, in white collar crimes, I think that will go a long way in tax matters. Wonderful. <laughs> they are not working. <laughs> File another writ. <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. I think, I think it has been a great exchange and I hope we give you a good reason to step away from lunch for, for a couple of 10 minutes and to hear. I mean, all the panelists are available in the, in, in the, in the venue. So, Feel free to reach out to any of them. I'll be shuttering here and there if you want to talk to me. Um, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we take a selfie? Let's take a photo. Uh, Leonard, oh, where's my? Can I grab my phone?